All right, guys, such a again today. Hope you're all doing well and enjoying your day so far. Welcome back to Valorant News. Plenty going on today. NRG FNS discussing how far behind he believes NRG are based on the fact that artists won't get to the US for still quite some time to come. But also Tarek having a go at Wardell for his attitude in a match online. Is this something that could affect what Wardell's team potentially with Stewie 2K could perform like going into January? Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always. I would greatly appreciate it. Plenty to discuss. Firstly, this I thought was remarkable. Looking it. This is uh, hours watched on Twitch over the last uh, 12 months, really, from this entire year. And in terms, okay, peak viewership, the numbers are a little bit different. But um, if we look at just pure hours watched, Valorant has just blown everything else out of the park. Apex Legends, CSGO, Fortnite, Warzone, everything else. Valorant's been, like, by far and above the most watched shooter on Twitch this season or this year, which has been absolutely absurd to think about, to be honest. But um, that's the thing. Valorant's not just esports, but it's also just general content creation it works so well for. Now, another big piece of news yesterday, Cloud9 White officially released from Cloud9. Now, um, you know, given what else is going on at Cloud9 right now, the um, the fact that they dropped or released some of their other teams, we did speculate why did, um, you know, why was Cloud9 White been removed, right? Is it kind of a cost-cutting measure? Like, um, why do they not commit to this team given they were so strong this season and seemingly did so well? Now, the reason actually comes down to a Riot decision rather than a, um, than a Cloud9 one, which is very interesting. And this is kind of another consequence of what we discussed with the academy teams and the fact that the um well that the franchise teams aren't allowed to have an academy roster because Mel and the others here they don't want to just be the game changer team they don't want to just be the female team they don't want to just be the best female team in North America they want to actually compete in the regular circuit where they can try and be a champion in their own right rather than on the just purely on the game changer side so you know this is where it gets kind of interesting as Mel goes on to say Cloud9 White here and does a twit longer describing it and says simply put my contract term has run its course and my teammates and I have decided to explore new opportunities. I'll make sure this is on screen. When the partnered league was announced, Jack, that's Jack Etty and the head guy at Cloud9, offered to work with me to build a top co-ed roster for Ascension. Cloud9 White would have continued to exist, but this additional team would be built for those of us looking to take on a new challenge in our careers. So Mel has been clear about this before, that she doesn't want to just be the best game changers player. She wants to just, you know, be as competitive as she can in the main scene. Unfortunately, this plan became impossible when it was announced that academy teams would not be allowed for partnered orgs. Regardless, Jack and management did give us the chance to resign and continue with Cloud9 Whites, but, um, you know, we were not dropped. So basically, they're looking for, you know, looking to take the next step. And this is one of the questions really about the game changers ecosystem in general, or the idea about kind of like having female teams in the female sides, is that, you know, it's a question whether it does. I think the way that game changers has been done has certainly helped that side of the scene, but there has been some questions as to whether it's actually worthwhile, because you then get the best game changers players. They want to not, they don't want to compete in game changers anymore. They want to go up and compete and try and make it in the proper partnership league and become the best player in the world, which is totally justified, but Game Changers doesn't necessarily let them do that, and because Cloud9 aren't allowed an academy team, they can't stay on Cloud9, they've now got to go elsewhere, and Mel will more than likely join an organisation that isn't in the, you know, isn't in the partnered league, and try and find another option, but also it's relatively last minute, right? Like, if Mel and these, uh, those other girls, like, want to go and join another team in, in the challenger side to make it through for the January qualifiers, like, um, there isn't really that much time left to consider it, so I'm not exactly sure what the future is going to be here but um yeah i think pretty cool stuff and maybe if it doesn't work out they can go back to game changers and maybe reform cloud nine white i'm not exactly sure what the plan would be but um yeah nonetheless i thought some interesting implications from that announcement but of course wishing the best for everyone involved but surely riot might have to reconsider some of their rules on this just because you know as it currently stands doesn't seem like the best for all parties this just to quickly mention here all the vct amia players have now been confirmed and announced on the various lineups so this is everything if you guys missed it over the last several weeks also, a further update here I thought was funny. So, Zekin, Sentinel Zekin, has been playing it because Sentinels haven't really been practicing as a team because, um, you know, the Sassy Mankana stuff, I'm not sure, has been fully sorted out yet. So, probably in the new year, Sentinels begin practicing. Same, I would imagine, with NRG, and we'll see that here in a second. But for now, Zekin is, um, you know, just grinding away on his own tournaments. And last night, he played a tourney, played 10 maps, played 10 unique agents, which is quite an impressive feat. And um, this is one of the games that they played here. Cry is free is his team taking down Project 7 and um, as you guys can see you know plus 19, 1.3 rating played a Killjoy, a Neon and a Jet over the series, won the series and then is moving on to, well actually has qualified successfully for the LAN event in Fullerton, so kind of crazy stuff, but um, yeah the Nerd Street Valorant Lockdown Open 3, so by making it all the way through here to the semi-finals as they have done, they've locked up a top 4 finish at the tournament and all of these top 4 teams including Zekin's team will be able to
able to go to the lockdown finals in Fullerton relatively soon on January 14th through the 16th. This is interesting though, because if he does attend this tournament and he has no qualified trip right with this Cryers free team, then you know, will the team, will Sentinels want that to be the case, right? If he's flying out to, you know, if he's going out to Fullerton, California, I guess it's relatively local for where these guys are generally based, but um, still it might cost him a couple of days of practice. Will the Sentinels team be happy about that? I don't really know. So I thought it was interesting. Now, the other two clips I wanted to share here were from the NRG side, well, initially from what FNS says last night. So three content creators who could go pro if they really tried to quit streaming. Mine are Tarek, Timmy, and Trout. What do you guys think? I don't really know if that kind of Timmy and Trout team is happening any longer because it was going to happen and then it kind of um, has kind of fizzled out a little bit over the last couple of weeks. Not really sure if that's going to be the case anymore. Even as Chet says, though, mine are Marved, Sabrosa, and Wardell. So, of course, Sabrosa stepped away from TSM. Marved, right? I mean, look, Chet can't go two seconds without talking talking about Marved. I wanted to get him back on, on their team. So, um, you know, I feel like it's got to happen at some point, but uh, not for now. Marv has taken a break. And Wardell is the other one that he mentions. So just between FNS and Wardell here, I thought I'd share a couple of clips because FNS talking about the fact that NRG are a little behind as it stands in terms of, um, you know, their level right now compared to the other teams in the league because, you know, teams like 100 Thieves, they're practicing, they're, they're getting ready to go and NRG is sitting there kind of twiddling their thumbs playing ranked all day and not actually practicing as a team until artists gets everything sorted and can get out in the new year we imagine. The other clip I wanted to share was from Tarek right talking to Wardell where you know Wardell starts complaining about stuff Tarek shuts him down and I thought some good you know mindset really it shows two sides of things because Wardell you know the frustration the toxicity or whatever like that's kind of been part of his style but at the same time he calms it down quickly and gets back focused which um is also the sign of a top player. Don't you guys feel like you're behind other teams not having any practice? Uh well we have four players from the core team already so we still have that chemistry built up. It's just going to take like a week for us to get back into the swing of things. And then obviously adding an artist, uh, we don't feel like it's going to be a problem uh, settling him in to our, like how we play. I think he would adapt, but no, I don't think we're going to be that far behind as long as we use our time effectively. Wait for that. Wait, 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 wait for him to point. They're, they're both there, uh, Monarch. They're both no, there. No, no, they're both there. They're both there. Are they? I'm gonna just, do... just clear 410 together. I planted. One One nice, he's in the old somewhere. He's gonna be on the right side. He's gonna be on the right side. Oh my god. Good job, good job. Ward down, stop freaking out. Don't backseat. Just calm down, man. He's I'm staying where he is and he's pan right. Don't panic, bro. Like, you gotta play for OT there, here. Man. man. How the f are we gonna play with this guy Just on stage, bro? Just be ready for he's it. Freaking That's the all f out, man. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take it. Like, it's fine, honestly. My bad. I'm sorry, Monarch. Don't apologize. Just do better. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll try not to speak when I'm dead. So in terms of your perspective on what do you think will happen here with Wardell, because he's meant to be teaming with that Stewie2K roster, right? And uh, yeah, Stewie2K bracked, it was going to be Exalt, he's now no longer there. So not exactly still sure what's going on with that team, no confirmations yet or anything. But um, yeah, Wardell's meant to be on that lineup. We know that Stewie and Wardell, there was some drama a few months ago where Stewie was like, or Wardell was saying to Stewie that, yeah, like um, it, you, you have to be brain dead to play this game, or like brain dead players could be good at this game, or something along those lines. And it now seems they're going to team up and try and run it up this season season in the challenger sides, but whether they'll qualify, we shall see. But I thought an interesting couple of clips. Do you think NRG are only a week behind or are NRG further behind than that? Of course, Chet here wins uh, based on the kind of community voting stuff, coach of the year from Willminder. So you know, congratulations, of course. But yeah, nonetheless, how far do you think NRG are behind? Is one week of practice enough to catch them up to the level where, you know, 100 Thieves are, where Cloud9 are? Same goes for Sentinels. Coming into the first event of the season in February in Sao Paulo, if they've only got four good weeks of practice, is, is that going to be enough to be at the same level or 100 Thieves still going to be ahead of the rest of the Americas by the time they get to Sao Paulo not too far from now and just before we close out the video I thought I'd mention this here kind of an interesting article that actually comes out on Valorant.com about the 9-3 curse discussing the, um, the numbers behind it and the fact that there is something going on here at 9-3 that it seems that when a team is 9-3 down they do have a kind of um, you know a substantially higher chance to win than they should the same thing seems to occur 
also at 8-4, but relative 8-4 to 9-3, it's interesting that compared to the amount of times that you should win or teams that should win down 8-4, to four, they win about 5% more often than that or 5 percentage points more often than that when they're down 8-4 and they win about 4.41 percentage points more often than that when they're down 9-3. And um, you'd think that this number would actually drop off a fair bit from the 8-4 number, but even that is quite interesting in and of itself. So yeah, there is something according to this article going on at 9-3. Now there's nothing like, okay, as soon as you go down 9-3, you're guaranteed to win the game. Like, you know, in terms of pure numbers, still the team that goes down 9-3 only wins like 12% of the time. But um, still, it's kind of interesting that there is something going on there when a team goes down 9-3. More than likely, it's something to do with the other team getting a bit too confident and thinking, okay, the game's locked up at 9-3. And maybe it's also kind of um, the way the economy tends to work in the game, that being down by that many rounds can give its advantages at certain which one you, once you start making a comeback. But um, I mean, yeah, I thought it was interesting to look at. They did an official article on this and it found something is going on. But hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you are new. Take care and I'll see you next time.